to that. Okay. Recording in progress. All right, everybody. Thanks again for joining us. Uh, we're going a little off script tonight because of technical difficulties, but we have Drake White with us tonight. She is going to be talking about monarchs, migration, and native milkweed. And this is, uh, we picked this month to do it because it's October and monarchs are starting to round up and uh, and they're moving through. So it's a great time to, to talk about this and what we can do as, uh, as citizen scientists and as uh, conservators of nature and, and all of that to uh, to help out these guys. Um, Drake, I am going to read your bio. Okay. She's the founder of the Nectar Bar and is dedicated to the conservation of our native pollinators. Drake is a Texas master naturalist, native landscape certified, and the designer and former, I believe, project manager of the Butterfly Learning Center at Phil Hardberger Park. Yes. Yeah. This is an outdoor classroom for native plants, butterflies, and other pollinators. Uh, Ms. White has spent the last six years raising various butterfly species while creating awareness for their needs. She also educates on proper practices for rearing butterflies in the classroom and in backyard residential gardens. Um, Drake has a Facebook group, The Nectar Bar, Raising Butterflies, um, and this provides a learning space to ask questions and interact with the, an online community. Also, she posts instructional videos on her YouTube channel, and I have a, a link written out here, but I imagine if somebody were to go to YouTube and type in the Nectar Bar, they would find your channel. Um, and also her business page, uh, you can find on Facebook, and that's, um, that's the Nectar Bar. So uh, I'm gonna turn it over to you, Drake. All right, thank you so much um, for having me. Um, sorry again about the technical difficulties here. Um, but hopefully if you want to see this, it'll be transferred over and you guys can view it. But tonight we're going to talk about monarchs migration and native milkweeds. Um, and one of the things that um, we want to kind of think about and kind of have an, a knowledge assessment of um, things are um, my, monarch um, migrating patterns as well as um, what kind of helps them um, and how do we know that they go from Canada to Mexico and back? Um, so here's a few things um, in case you don't know, um, there may, may be some that are joining us that they kind of know a bit, um, but in case you don't, I'm gonna kind of get a little technical um, and that way if someone's brand new that they're gonna understand what we're talking about. So monarchs are known as Danis plexippus. Um, monarchs develop from eggs to adult in about a month or so's time depends on how hot we are. The hotter it is, the faster it is. Um, and monarchs travel 3,000 miles or more from Canada to Mexico and back. They are the only um, butterfly that's known yet that does a two-way migration like birds. Um, another thing to think about through here is the development from eggs. Um, as I just had mentioned that it varies with temperature. Sometimes it's quicker. Right now, if we're getting eggs, it's gonna be a lot faster than in the spring because we're cooler temperature. So the fast, the hotter it is, the faster it is. Um, milkweed, when we talk about native milkweeds, it's always understanding um, the um, names, the, the actual Latin names. Sometimes um, plants that are not native, such as tropical milkweed are tricked by people that aren't aware or don't know um, scientific names and uh, they're called uh, by a scientific name that's actually not correct. So in being able to understand an ID, um, native milkweeds are important. Um, and then kind of how, how we tag. So this is just kind of a, a knowledge assessment of, of things that we're gonna kind of talk through and go through um, as we um, speak today. So modern butterflies, um, they, as I had said, they're Danis plexus, plexus, and they are in the brush foot family of butterflies. Um, they have little um, scratchy feet um, and that's kind of how they got their name brush footed. Um, there are several species of butterfly that are in the brush foot family. Queens are another one, which monarchs and queens are the insects that um, use the milkweed uh, as a host plant. Uh, host plant meaning that that's the plant that the adult butterfly 
uh, will lay her eggs and the eggs will hatch and the caterpillars will eat um, the, the plant's leaves. Um, so we're kind of going to go through just a, a life cycle. Um, when a butterfly comes through in, in spring or as of right now, um, some that are migrating down from Mexico, um, we're in peak migration now. Like October is, is typically really peak migration. Um, this year, for whatever reason, we've, we've, um, we'll, it's a lot of um, global warming, global climate change, things like that, that we've had kind of an early migration this year. So it really started mid-August this year um, and kind of uh, some are continuing to go, but some are breaking that diapause, that sexual diapause, mating and leaving eggs. So um, typically right now, as we're 95 and hotter, um, when the egg is laid, within three to five days, the egg is going to hatch and um, they're gonna start eating the leaves of the milkweed. Um, that's why host plants are important for every species of, of butterfly, but for the monarch, milkweed is all that they can eat. They can't eat any other plant. Um, and some of them are, they, they like some more than others. <laughs> um, and we'll kind of get into that, but it's important because, you know, we, we want to make sure that we have enough and we have um, a lot of it available when we're building our habitats or re restoring habitat um, into na uh, natural areas um, because the native ones are better for them. The non-native, uh, they can carry disease and things like that. So when they're laying their eggs on, on them, it takes them about three to five days to hatch out. Um, and it's the only plant that they can lay their eggs on in, in order for them to survive. There's several different species. There's like over a hundred different species of a native milkweed, um, but there's just a few that are native to Texas. So the whole United States, there's lots of different species, but you wanna make sure that they're native to our areas. And the native milkweed that we do best here in Bear County is antelope horn, green antelope horn, zizotes, Texana milkweed, and then fringe twine vine milkweed. It's a milkweed vine. Um, and another one is Tateliote milkweed vine. Those are the two actual milkweed vines that um, they do use as a host plant, as opposed to um, say pearl milkweed vine, which is a great, wonderful, beautiful plant, um, a good pollinator plant, um, but they'll kind of use that as a last resort. So understanding and knowing how to ID these um, are really, really important and that you have enough of them. Because the butterflies, they can lay anywhere from three to 500 eggs um, each. As they're growing, their first, second, and third instars, they're not quite eating so much. But once they get bigger, when you can really, really tell they're growing, um, you notice they're fairly large, um, then you can start to notice that they start eating you out of house and home, really. <laughs> They'll just eat the plant leaves down and don't worry, it is not gonna kill the plants. Um, that's what they're there for. And the plant is used to that and it actually helps the plant um, grow a bit better. So once they've gone through their um, instars, just instars meaning that um, when it's born and as soon as it comes out of the egg, um, it, that is its first instar. And then it's gonna eat a little bit. Um, and a day or two later, it's going to shed its skin. It's gonna turn around and eat that skin, ew. Um, and then it's gonna go ahead and continue eating onto the leaves um, of the plant. So each time that it sheds its skin, um, it'll do that five times before its final shed and going into chrysalis. Each one of those is called an instar. Um, and so once it's gone through the five instars and it's shed for the final time and it goes into pupil stage, then you're gonna have about an eight to 14 days um, from before you have a butterfly. Um, it's really, again, gonna depend on the, the heat. Um, if we're nice and warm, it's gonna be quicker. It'll probably be in about seven to 10 days. If it's in the spring when it's cooler temperatures, 
it'll be every bit of that 14 days um, for it to come out and be a butterfly. Um, once it has you closed, um, then it takes roughly, it comes out, it's all crinkly, it looks kind of deformed, um, but it comes out and it starts pumping all the fluid from its abdomen into the wings. Um, and that takes approximately 30 seconds to be fully fl full of its wing, fluid, full of it. Blah. The fluid is fully into its wings and it's nice and full and ready to dry. Within um, about a maybe 30 minutes to an hour, um, it'll start to flutter a little bit and it's ready to go and fly within two to three hours for sure. Um, so if you're kind of seeing this out in nature and you're watching it come out, that is actually when it's the most vulnerable too because it can't fly yet. It takes it about two to three hours um, before it can fly. Uh, sometimes people, they'll notice it and it's like maybe hanging on a plant and they think something's wrong with it. Oh, it can't fly. Um, and it's probably just really fresh and it's not, it's time yet. So it's always, if you see this or if you happen to be rearing them um, in, your, in a classroom or at home, um, this is a time that you definitely don't want to touch them because uh, you can accidentally damage their wings while they're trying to uh, fully dry. Um, when they come or when they uh, eat clothes and they're out and their wings are open, it's easy to tell the difference between a male and a female. Um, the males, they have, when their wings are open, you'll be able to see on the hind wings, um, two little black dots, one on each side um, that are near um, kind of the lower end of the wing. Um, that is the scent patch for the male monarch. So that is how you'll be able to tell that that's a, a male and it obviously won't be there um, for the female. So there won't be any of the little scent patch there. It's kind of like raised up. So when you see it in person, um, I'm, I know I'm, I'm talking as if you could see the actual, <laughs> yeah, the actual thing in, that I'm seeing here for you guys, but you'll be able to see it um, if you go through and, and watch this again uh, when they send it to you. Um, but in person, it's easy to see, it's kind of raised up and it looks, um, it kind of looks like a little beauty mark for them. Um, the coloration on, on these, on monarchs um, and, and queens, um, the bright, vivid coloration of them um, kind of is the warning sign to birds um, and other predators that, hey, I'm, I'm poisonous, you don't want to eat me. Um, so while they're eating the, the milkweed, they, they take within their um, bodies the poisons and toxins from the actual milkweed and that makes them poisonous. So if a bird or a lizard or anything eats it, they're gonna get really sick. And hopefully um, they remember not to ever, ever do that again. <laughs> um, so going back in through, now that they're ready, they're, they're flying on the way and they're either, if like right now they are in fall migration. Um, this is the fifth instar. If you have any milkweed in your habitats right now or in any gardens that you may be at, um, helping out with, and you're seeing caterpillars, these are the fifth generation. These are the, the if we get a fifth generation here, these are the generation that will continue and grow up and, and um, fly down to Mexico. They will overwinter there, and then they will mate um, late January, beginning first few weeks of February. They'll start to wake up, they'll mate, and then they'll start their journey back up to, um, to the United States about March. Um, so March through mid-May is the first generation. So they'll come through, they'll lay their eggs. Um, they'll, those ones then will die. Then their eggs will raise up, or will grow up, eat down the plants, go through their life cycle, and then they will continue north where they will go and have the second generation. Um, May through um, June is the second generation. Then they continue and this life cycle just keeps continuing all the way up for the third and fourth generation. Fourth generation um, monarch caterpillars are typically born from July through August um, from Canada all the way down. We here in, in, in Texas 
get a fifth generation, but anything that's a little bit north or north of um, Oklahoma, they will get a fourth generation. They only get four generations where we get a fifth generation um, that kind of comes down. And all those mid-August through um, October, any caterpillars that are born then um, definitely are the ones that will be making it down um, for the migration. And that's how it's, it's kind of, it's like, it's, that's the kind of miracle of it. Cause we wonder like, how do they know? How do they know to do that? And, but how do we know? Um, we know because we have um, gotten tagging um, and the tags on them have helped us as citizen scientists had, us as citizen scientists have helped the scientists um, get out there and continue the research um, to, to be able to do this. Um, monarchwatch.org, you can go to there and find out all kinds of information on how to tag if you've never done it. Definitely come to the festival. Um, you'll have a, a hands-on experience doing that because we will be tagging uh, butterflies there as well. So you'll get a hands-on experience doing that. Um, but we know that. We know that through this tagging that our efforts and the scientists' efforts has shown us that they have done a two-way migration. So it's from Canada to Mexico and then back. Um, and it's pretty neat to know that. And with those last generations too, the fourth and fifth generations are the only generations that are living um, anywhere from six to nine months. The rest of them, they only live a few months um, and then they die and their next generation carries on um, with the migration, with, whether it's uh, spring, or for the spring and then for the fall, the only the um, fourth and fifth generation are the ones that are um, migrating down to the south. So what's all the hoopla about it? Well, we have learned that there is um, a big drop in the monarch population. Um, there has actually been a little bit of an increase as of last year, obviously, for 2020, we don't have any data on that um, because of COVID. So I don't think very many people were out um, collecting that data. So there's nothing for that. But as of um, 2019, December of 2019, the numbers, the monarch population had actually gone up. Um, but then we had a big freeze for 2020 um that happened and so now we don't know what has happened with that population um but it's really really important to understand that even though that their numbers are up they're still having um, a hard time because of deforestation which is happening in in, in mexico um they need these conifer trees um to roost in the places where they they are um, and unfortunately, deforestation happens. Then it's also with us here um, in, in America where, you know, farm crops, um, more spaces are being eradicated and habitats are being eradicated for us to put up buildings and houses and things like this. So if we are choosing to be good land stewards, um, then if we just put in um, a little bit to give back, maybe something very small, something very small as five plants um, that could even be in a pot. So maybe you're in an apartment or something, um, you could put it in a pot and still be doing your part um, as a good land steward um, that will still serve as a purpose and a mini way station. Um, or um, if you have lots of land, then obviously you'll have lots of space and area to work with. But we wanna make sure that if we're causing one, well, us as you know, home buyers or or things like that are causing habitat loss, then we want to actually give back um, and put in and do our, our, our best to give back for these pollinators. Um, also the use of pesticides and herbicides. So it's not just the, you know, the farmer and the agriculture that is putting these out. Um, unfortunately, humans do it too. Regular people do it too. Um, if we just stop using pesticides and herbicides, and really, really concentrate on not putting in introduced species, nothing that is non-native to um, spread over and, and take over our native habitats so that 
these uh, species can survive. That's really, really important um, that if our plants aren't here, then they're not gonna really be able to survive. And once you, you're kind of um, talking about one specific insect, it ends up being just a, 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 a downward spiral to everything else. Because even when you're planting for one thing, you might be planting for a monarch butterfly, but um, as the bird comes in and starts eating the seeds from that plant or, or eating other little insects and ladybugs come in to eat the aphids, like there's all kinds of things that happen. So you plant for one thing and you end up helping and benefiting other things as well. So we can always think about that too. Um, but definitely here for us, um, it's really, really important that we can do our part because we are the um, central flyway. We are in the funnel part down the corridor of 35 all the way to Mexico. So if everyone here was putting in um, just a few plants um, or a lot of plants, um, then you can be doing your part to kind of help them over. And even if you didn't want necessarily host plants, definitely right now, nectar plants are what is really, really needed um, to fuel them up and get them going into um, on their journey. You know, the, one of the biggest nectar um, plants that I have right now that they're just draping like jewelry um, is frostweed. I, that thing just fuels them up. Um, it, it, it hosts a lot of, of nectar um, out of everything that I have blooming in the yard. That's the one that they're going to right now. So um, just knowing too, what can, hey, what can I do that, which plants could I put that will actually just help them just fuel up like crazy um, that will benefit them as they're in their migration. And then obviously planting native milkweeds. Um, you, if you don't want to um, have things that require a lot of care and water, the best things, native milkweeds, plant them, ignore them. They don't like a lot of water. If you're overwatering them, um, and overwatering means if you're watering them once every two weeks, that's still too much. Um, they don't like fertilizer. So you don't have to really just plant them, water them in and tell them how pretty they are. And they'll be so happy with just that. Um, and just let them, let them do their thing, enjoy them and watch them um, as they come through. Um, tropical milkweeds are the things that we really, really want to stay away from uh, just because it is not, one, it's not native. Their, their germination rate um, for their seeds are a 98% germination rate. So that means when they fluff out and they get into our natural areas, 90% um, of those seeds are going to sprout and grow and then um, cause um, the other plants not to get the nutrients and things that they need. Um, our natives. But also, since we're warmer, it tends to um, not die back in the summer or sometimes even in the winter unless we really, really get cold. But here, um, that's not often. So it never really dies back like our natives do. Our natives die back um, as soon as we get a cold front, a good cold snap, they'll die back in the winter. And then they die back again in summer because they're saving their energy. Um, for fall to come back when we get a good rain. So when we're nice and hot and scorching um, and there's not, not any water, um, they're gonna go dormant. So while they're dormant, <coughs> excuse me, they will um, <coughs> also be clearing themselves of OE. <coughs> excuse me. Um, OE is a protosome parasite that infects monarchs and queen butterflies. I have learned that the one that um, affects the monarch and the one that affects the queen butterfly, they are completely different um, protozoans, but both are OE protozoans. Um, and we want to make sure that we're not um, causing or being the cause of um, unhealthy butterflies um, or other insects. So that's the problem with tropical milkweed. If you have it, please, I encourage you to take it out. Um, if you are not one that wants to take it out, at least cut it to the dirt twice a year, June 1st, and then uh, I always say um, October 31st, November 1st, um, keep it cut down, cut it down all the way to the dirt and keep it cut down until after January. But I really, really encourage the fact that don't buy it, don't plant it. This is one, if 
this is one that they often in in the nursery trade will um, sell as butterfly weed or Asclepias um, tuberosa when it's actually Kursovska. Um, so the easiest way to know if you are getting the correct native Asclepias tuberosa is if you pull off a leaf and there's sappy milk that comes off, it is not the native. Um, the native one will not have that. The other milkweeds will, the other native milkweeds will, but for the, the specific butterfly weed, um, it will not. And if it's in the pot and it's like two foot tall and like a foot wide, it's nice, bushy, big, huge plant, Native milkweeds in a pot um, are not going to grow that big. They can't because they have to grow their taproot first. Um, and obviously, we don't carry around big old pots um, for, for tiny little plants to grow their 10-foot taproot. So um, mil native milkweeds will always be fairly small in the pot until you plant them. And then they will literally um, grow a nice, good, deep root and show off once it's in the ground. But if it's looking nice and showy in a pot, in a pot it is not a native and I highly suggest just um, ignoring it uh, or ignoring the purchase. Don't, don't purchase it at all. <laughs> um, or if you already have it in the landscape, maybe you purchased a house that um, already has it in the landscape, I encourage to pull it out or at least maintain it uh, and be a good land steward by cutting it back properly and making sure that once it's bloomed, the pods are done, cut those pods so that they is cut the blooms before it even starts a pod. Um, Cause sometimes those seeds can still ripen out even if um, you have already cut them off. So we don't want any of the seeds to escape and get into um, our native uh, areas. Um, is there any questions? Yes, um, Drake, I wanna talk specifically about tropical milkweed. Um, because I work in the nursery business and that, that is what is sold at nurseries is tropical milkweed. Yep. I think and I've seen one flat of native milkweed this whole year and it yep. was four inch containers yep. and it was the green antelope. Yep. So I want to encourage everybody, every single time you go to the nursery, Number one, don't buy tropical milkweed. You've just heard all the reasons why it's, it's doing a disservice to our native plants, our monarchs. Um, and um, I want to encourage everyone because the owners and management hear it from me all the time, but they need to hear from customers yes. that you want to buy native milkweed and that you will not buy tropical and you will encourage your friends not to buy tropical. Yeah. The owners need to hear directly from consumers. This is such a consumer driven yep. business like well, anything is, but, um, it is. I, and, the, and, and the big problem of that though is, is actually, unfortunately it's on the consumer end because, people want instant gratification they do and so they are unwilling to take a plant that literally so uh, like I, I I grow and I sell native milkweeds and and I have a lot of people that will look at me crazy when I give a plant that's about three inches tall if that and have like three or four little leaves on it um, yeah. and they're like what are you giving me and why <laughs> is it this and it's just like well, this took two years wow. and that's why the nursery trade there's not a lot of growers that are willing to put in that effort when yeah. people are like well I don't want that because it's not this big bushy beautiful plant so yeah. it's it's being aware and this is why I have my YouTube channel Instagram you name it go on there you can see for yourself how many schools that I work with how many people that I place them in their gardens they will literally be a two inch little stick with three leaves on it in spring and by fall it's already a foot and a half wide by two foot tall full of blooms because right. it has to be planted in the ground before it shows you anything um so it's just really understanding the process 
um, antelope horns, even if you get them in their little four inch pots and you put them in the ground, one, they're still expensive because it took two years to grow it. Um, and then two, um, antelope horn takes a bit longer. That taproot is literally 10 feet deep. Wow. And it's going to show you nothing the first two years. So people are like, and it typically you'll plant it and it's going to grow a little bit and then do nothing. And then it's going to look like it dies. And it's really not. And a lot of people make the mistake of pulling it out because like, oh, it died. And I'm like, no, <laughs> it's growing the roots. So it's saving its energy and not going to show you anything above the soil. And you won't get a flower from that for three years. So mm -hmm. It takes time and it takes patience. If you want instant gratification, you have to know, you can plant those ones, but plant some other native flowers to give you that instant gratification. But also Texana and Zizothes, those are the two that will give you first year blooms and first year flowers, or first year flowers and first year seed pods. Um, okay. Those are the only two milkweed that I know locally for us that do that. Um, so yeah, get Texana and get Zizotes um, because you will get those instant gratification and plant the other ones that you, you won't notice that they're not doing anything <laughs> because mm -hmm. the other ones are showing off for you. So it's really just understanding and having the patience. It's really the consumer fault because they're not educating themselves on how it goes or they think that they know, um, but the, they, they're impatient and the, or they think that it died you have to really understand the behavior of native milkweed as it um, is growing. And it's, it's first year is it's gonna, you put it in, it's not gonna do anything. And then it looks like it dies and it's gonna grow back a little, little bit. And then it's gonna die again. And then it's gonna do a little something. And then it, it may not even show itself for a year. <laughs> right. And then all of a sudden here it is in all its glory. Um, and that's just kind of how, especially Animal corn is the number one that does that way. So people get so discouraged. And, and I mean, if you're trying with one specific plant, yes, I would be feeling discouraged too. I went through it. So I understand what people feel. Um, but you have to know and plant the other ones. That way you have that instant gratification to kind of um, make you forget about the other ones and what they're not doing yet for you. <laughs> right. So yeah, that, I, I mean, I just learned so much from what, what you've just been talking about the native milkweeds. Um, and I, uh, I, again, I, I just want to encourage people to reach out directly to the owners of nurseries, mm -hmm. post it on the Facebook page of the nurseries, post it um, on a Yahoo review. Like it's such a consumer driven um, industry. And so when, when the owners are hearing this directly from customers, that's the best way that we can make change and also educating, like, yeah. like you're telling us right now about what to expect, but why it's so much better for the monarch population than, you know, these, yeah, these tropical milkweeds are two feet tall and they're blooming and they look great. And so it, it's going to take a lot of educating, um, on our part to, to explain why this, this isn't the best, this isn't the best we can do for the monarchs. We can do a lot better. So I, yes. I just, uh, I just had to give that little spiel cause I see it firsthand every day and it makes yes. me great, you know? Yep. And I, and I have people that even, even call me because I, I, I'm, I'm a small local nursery. Um, mm -hmm. but, and they'll ask me, Hey, do you have, nope, I don't. <laughs> Yeah. I, do not have, I have native milkweed and I do not have tropical. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No. Well, and I invoke, I invoke the nectar bar in your name all the time when I'm at work. So I, I'm, I'm trying to do what I can to get people, you know, in the, in the right direction. Um, we do have a couple of questions, um, from the chat room and, um, one of the questions is about uh, monarchs overwintering in San Antonio instead of going to Mexico. And um, is there any theory about why they, may, why they might stay and go no further south? I would say warmer falls and tropical milkweed, in fact, are keeping them here. Uh, you're the expert, but yeah, um, so, I've heard 
check out that. It, it, it really is. And in, in, in all honesty, I mean, there's, a, there's still a lot of research to be done on why that's starting to happen here. Um, but yeah, more, it's more global warming than, than it even is so much the um, tropical milkweed. But yeah, I mean, if they, if they think they're already there, they're not going to go. They're not going to continue right. their journey. But global warming is, is a very big thing. And that's very big part. And there's still a lot of research to be done. The best thing is to just encourage them to just fuel up and continue going. Um, and, and it's really too. So a, a lot of people, it really not so much to do with the, the milkweed. It's the heat. The heat is what makes them break their sexual diapause. So um, it, it's not the milkweed. It's not them smelling their milkweed because if that were the case all the way down, they would do it. It's once they get here, we're hotter than we normally are mm-hmm. <laughs> at that specific time. So it's definitely global warming um, that, that plays that part um, in, in that part. So um, we can do our part also to kind of slow that down. And, of course. and our and all of our choices and, and the things that we consume. So um, yeah, there's still a lot of research to be done though. I'm not the scientist behind that, um, but talking with Dr. Chip Taylor um, and a few other uh, lepidopterists, that's what their stance is on that right now. Of course, of course. Um, uh, along with that same question, um, they are asking, um, generally, are there roughly the same number of generations of monarchs on their way north as on the return trip on their fall migration? Um, um, typically, there is the largest group is the fall migration. Um, because what happens is they'll, they'll go, obviously, m- most of them, well, hopefully most of them make it, but then they, they mate and they lay their first eggs and then they die. So mm-hmm. once they mate and they, they've, the males definitely, once they've done their part, they just die. And that's mm-hmm. typically what they're finding on the forest floors to give us our um, information of, oh, hey, this one made it and that one made it because they've already mate, they've made their eggs and, and carrying on. So um, mm-hmm. it's typically, you're not going to have as of a mass going north because it's the first generation, they come here, the eggs are laid, then those die. They're not continuing up. They're not going past Texas, period. Right. Um, so they're just coming here, they're laying their eggs here, then those ones are going up. And then those ones die in the next couple of states up. And then the caterpillars from there, they continue going up. So it's not the same going north because they're not making, it's only the, the, the fall migration that has the largest and the only one also that's doing the two-way. So they're going down and then turn around and come back mm-hmm. um, to continue that flight up. So it's definitely right. a fall is the bigger one. And you said that the fourth and fifth generations that are migrating in the fall, I didn't know they live like six to nine months versus yep. just a couple of months, like the yep. first generation. So yep. that's really yep. cool to learn. Um, and also uh, the native climbing milkweed, is it as desirable to monarchs as other native milkweeds? Um, so, maybe you can give so us- the the only two, there are several of the, um, of the native milkweed, climbing milkweeds or my, mm-hmm. milkweed vines. The mm-hmm. only two um, that I'm, I'm aware of or that I've I have experience with, and then um, that has even been spoken to me about teleody milkweed vine and the fringe twine vine. Those are the only two um, that are on are on record for here um, that they use it. In other states, yes, but here in, in, in Texas um, or here in Bear County, those are the two that they will use um, that are native for us. Pearl milkweed vine, the... Um, the uh, queen will use it kind of as a, as a last resort. If there's nothing else, they'll use that. Um, but typically the other, the other two, um, and it's, and it's really, it's really strange because sometimes certain years are a different preference. There's, there's been, um, times where I, so in my own habitat, I have more, um, um, milkweed vine than I do, have actual native milkweeds of Texana and Zizotes and things like that. So 
I get them more on my fringe twine vine than on anything else. In some mm -hmm. years, I will only get it on that mm -hmm. <laughs> and nothing else. But this year, they're everywhere. They're on mm -hmm. both vines. They're on the Texana. They're on the Zizothes. They're on everything um, this year. And that's actually been, because usually it's like one year, they'll, they'll favor one over the other. Um, so this year, they're, they're on everything. They're eating me out of house and home. <laughs> Um, okay. but so fringe, yeah, that's, not, not French fringe, fringed, like, um, like a fringed hat like or a fringed, fringed. Okay. okay. Yep. Can you uh, spell the other one? The other native, uh, milkweed vine is the Taliote T A L A Y O T E. Taliote. Okay. Great. Thank you so much. You're welcome. So I wonder if, you know, the lockdown and things slowing down for a while in terms of global everything, I wonder if maybe that's had a, a, a positive effect on the monarch populations. I know? think, it, I think in a way that it has, um, for several reasons, um, one, we're not out destroying stuff mm -hmm. <laughs> and two, just even with my own, um, my own company, last year and this year full force people are more involved people are planting more pollinator gardens people are actually wanting more native things yes. so i think in a way it 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 was really beneficial on multiple different levels um yes because we weren't out there just you know creating more pollution and things like that right. but we were also putting back in and creating new habitats and new spaces for them to go so People um, are I've, spending more time in their yard. Yes, yes, yeah. and wanting to learn, and they're learning through a lot of different avenues. So yeah. um, they're actually having this kind of sweat equity. Um, mm -hmm. and, or, you know, they're just enjoying their spaces because mm -hmm. um, we were forced to enjoy our spaces. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> we we had to stay home, but you know, we yep. wanted to better enjoy it while we're there, right? Exactly. <laughs> Exactly. Yeah. Um, I, I want to uh, point out what you were saying earlier about how you can be a responsible land steward, even if you're renting an apartment and only have a balcony by putting, you know, native pollinator plants in a pot. Like, yes, I, I heard a, a quote recently about how we can provide habitat and food and um you know uh all these things for wildlife and and natives in our yards by yes. turning them from these big really hard to manage and and wasteful uh turf lawns and planting native plants and planting pollinator gardens and I think a lot of us think it's up to um, preserving, you know, national parks and things like that. But actually, we, we as, as, as all having yards or even a balcony can, if we all did that, it, it would be like a huge contribution and we can yes. do that. So, and, and a lot of people that are in apartments or have a, a, own a condo or a small townhouse, many of them believe that, well, they can't do anything because they just have a balcony or a little tiny patio. Right. Um, and, and I'm here to tell you, no, you can, you can still have a, 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 a mini way station. If you mm -hmm. have a 16 to 20 inch pot, mm -hmm. um, all you need in that 16 to 20 inch pot, um, you will put in one, um, uh, frost weed and then three to five, uh, of your native Zizotes and Texana. Those mm -hmm. are the two that would do fabulous in pots. Mm -hmm. Um, so if you have five of those plants in there and then one frost weed, you have yourself a mini little way station right on your patio. And the best thing about that too, is you don't even have to bring it in, in the winter. You can just leave it out and you don't have to worry about it. Right. Right. Um, uh, that's definitely a message we got to spread. Um, okay. Another question. Um, how long from milkweed seed ball scattering till blooming antelope horn milkweed? Um, so I'm going to assume they're asking about like, if you have it in a seed ball and you go and throw it. Um, yeah, that's what okay. it sounds like. Yeah. So if you're, if you're, um, laying out your seed, let's say you're doing it 
tomorrow, you're going out and you're throwing scattering seeds, whether it's in a seed ball or scattering any type of seed that's native, uh, that has the native um, uh, antelope horn in it, you're not going to have a flower until three years. Right. Yeah. Three to four years, depending on where you're at within our eco regions. But um, right. if you're within the black land prairie, it's every bit of three years before you ever see you, you'll have leaves and you'll mm -hmm. get plants that are growing. Um, but you're, you're it, three years, three to four years before you ever see a flower. And of course, in the meantime, there's other natives that you can plant to feed adults. Yes. You know, yes. like um, button bush, which is hard to find, but Greg's Miss Flower. We have, it. <laughs> we have button bush, but yes, yeah, so plant the nectar plants, but you can also, if you're scattering, to me, you can never, ever, ever have enough milkweed. So I always say plant milkweed fall and spring, because mm -hmm. once they find it, you're going to get eaten out of house and home. I promise mm -hmm. you. And you're going to be like, oops, I need some more. And it's not going to be established. So every year, if you're putting in or scattering seeds, it's going to be in abundance over the years as time goes and they grow. Um, so as you're scattering your animal corn, your green animal corn and your tuberosa, those are the three that take the longest to give you a flower and get them where then plant your zizotes and your texana because those are give you as soon as you plant it within a few months you're going to start seeing that it's already growing and by if you planted it in the spring let's say in mm -hmm. april you planted it right now it's blooming like crazy so mm -hmm. uh, that's it's just knowing knowing what you want to have that insta which ones give you the insta yeah. gratifications while you're patiently waiting for the other ones to show you something and right. marking your places because when you're scattering these seeds you need to remember to mark where you scat scattered or little no mo zone or something because you might be pulling what you don't realize is the actual milkweed coming up so putting That's them in scattering them in places that you're like hey okay let me just leave this area alone Right. Yeah, that's a that's a good point. And I, I think it's great to help people, um, people's expectations. Yes. Um, you know, with with something like, um, you know, like the antelope um, milkweed that it's it's such a great investment, but um, you're probably not going to see, you know, the real benefits from it for a few years, but um, and marking it, like you said, so you don't, you don't pull it up. I know that 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 happens a lot. Yep. Um, so somebody uh, has asked, Peter's asked um, the scientific name for fringed twine vine. And he asks, is it Adlumia fungosa? Um, Do you hold know? On. No, it's, 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 um, it's or, hold on. Let me. It's finasterum site, it's finasterum, F-U-N-A-S-T-R-U-M, and then C-Y-N-A-N-C-H-O-I-D-E-S. That's the fringe twine vine. That's the Latin. Great. Please don't ask me to say that last part because I'll butcher the name of it. Finasterum uh -huh. is the first part. That last part, I always mess it up. Okay, great. Um, another question about antelope horn, uh, participant says they've heard it's hard to grow and they've never seen it for sale. Um, again, I, I would say as consumers, we've, we've all got to go straight to the top at the nurseries because. Yeah. And so, and, and like, I, I and grow it, and but as soon as I, I grow it and I release it, it's gone. Um, so yeah. it's, it's really, if there is, is. If, I mean, it's, it's literally just knowing who has it, um, who has it and right. typically um, for antelope horn and for tuberosa, you're not going to typically find them until summer because they don't start coming out and it, it takes two years for them to be a couple of sprigs that you're gonna see, mm -hmm. but they start breaking dormancy even in your own spaces um, and not until March or I'm sorry, May. So mm -hmm. May is when they start coming up and, 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 and coming awake and, um, and showing something. So it's usually May, June when those are available. If there's someone specifically that wants it, then 
by all means, you can get on a list. I can have you on a list. And then, I mean, I have a list for spring already. If you want on that list um, for spring's um, native milkweeds, just let me know and can put you on. And how okay. many you want. That's good to know. Is that, I, I'm guessing that's probably on your, can you access that on your website or? Yeah, and, I'll, people... and I'll, make a, I'll make a Facebook and Instagram post um, about Great. that too. That way okay. that um, the information and you can share my contact information. That's fine. Okay. Oh, great. That sounds great. Um, let's see. Oh, somebody's just pointing out that uh, milkweed seeds are available from Native American seed. Uh, yes. That's a, a company out of Junction. They do. They have a lot of great um, Native All plants. of their stuff is amazing. I, this, yeah, I really this, this is actually the company that I will always tell folks to go to, um, even if mm -hmm. you're buy buying rooted plants um, or uh, rootstock um, or any type of seed. Uh, my experience with them over the years have been exactly what I've paid for. Um, unlike some of the other places that say, hey, this is this is this and then it grows. And and the frustrating part about that is, is I know it's not that, but someone that doesn't know when they're saying, hey, I bought this from there and they said it was this and it's not. Yeah. Um, Just like it, you were saying about the tropical milkweed, it, yes. it's being mislabeled, the botanical name on purpose. Yes. Uh, yes. And, and you can't tell from, a, from the seed, you know, you can't tell from a milkweed seed what's what. Um, I can mm -hmm. tell certain species um, mm -hmm. and I know that a tropical milkweed seed is 10 times bigger than a, a, the seed from the tuberosa, but that's because that's what I do. So I'm, of course, I'm going to know that, yeah. but your, your person that, that's on, that has not studied it and know it, they're not going to know. And it's not fair that you purchase something and it's not what you purchase. So yeah. um, Native American seed is definitely every single time it's been what they've said. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, that's good to know. Native American seed, y'all. Um, somebody has also shared the uh, Lady Bird Johnson Wildlife Center leak, uh, link, and um, I've I have found them to be a great source of yes pertinent, um, honest information about native plants. Yep, and when they have their native plant sales, they'll have different native milkweeds available there. Um, sometimes the Native Plant Society they'll have uh, native milkweeds available as well. Um, and I mean, there's there's a lot of there's some uh, in Medina Native Garden Nursery. Um, they'll also have some. Um, and then the Natives of Texas, I think it's called, or it's in Kerrville. Um, yeah, they're no, also another one that carries um, some of the native milkweeds. Okay. Um, and uh, yeah, somebody just uh, in our chat room uh, recommended Medina Nursery as well near Medina, yep. Texas. So, yes. um, so that's great. Thank you for, for letting us all know that. Um, if anybody has any questions or, or comments, you can go ahead and uh, type it in the chat and um, we'll try to get to those. We've only got a few minutes left, but... Um, well, uh, Amanda, can I make a comment? Yeah. Um, I, I frequently volunteer at Bolverde Oaks Nature Preserve and uh, I noticed over the years, the Monarch Watch project offers uh, milkweed plants for places that are nature preserves. Correct. Uh, and so we have applied uh, twice. Uh, we applied twice. Both times our, our application was granted. The first time we planted uh, maybe 200 plants. Uh, we have two big prairies. We planted in the prairie and other places. And we thought we had failed. Yeah. Uh, the next year, we went around looking. You know, we had put little flags where we planted them, and there was no milkweed. Uh, just, just exactly. as Drake was, just the same as Drake was saying. Uh, yeah. But then, uh, a year or two after that, there is milkweed. Yes. You know, mm -hmm. Not as many as we planted, but there's definitely uh, surviving milkweed that is blooming. So mm -hmm. given that some of those survived, we applied again, planted a couple hundred more. Same thing mm -hmm. happened. We can't find any of them. Uh, but I'm, I'm hoping 
that uh, at least some of them are going to survive and we're going to have more. Yeah, absolutely, you will. And I would apply as often and as many times as you can. Um, they they do it. And if you're a school teacher, if anyone here that's um, a school teacher or like a, a librarian for um, um, for a school or or a public library that has a space that has, you can also apply um, to receive the free milkweed. Also, um, monarchwatch.org. Um, that's where you can go to. Uh, yeah, they were live plants that they shipped. Yes. And they came through in surprisingly good shape, considering that they had to go through a shipment. Yep. And you you want to definitely plan when they come. Um, you want to make sure because they'll let you know. They'll keep you posted. Like, hey, okay, we're shipping them out. And they, you should receive them on such and such a date. And within a couple of days, you would want to be able to go ahead and plant them and get them in the ground um, because they're 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 going to be a bit shocked <laughs> from the shipping. Yes. Um, and you want to get them just straight in the ground, um, and water them in, and then just let them be and let them do their things. But yeah, just as he said, it's being patient because you get those little plugs, and it's going to look like nice for about a three, four weeks, and then it's going to look like it dies. <laughs> but that's because exactly. it's literally putting, it's growing its roots, and it has to grow its roots before it can show you thing above the soil. Um, so yeah, if you're a teacher, if you're at a, a any type of, of public area, you have, even if you're, um, like, I can't apply for it for my just regular backyard, but if you have acreage, and you're saying, hey, I'm restoring this to such and such, and and you can definitely um, apply for those free milkweeds also. Um, you just have to you know, meet the requirements that they, that they ask for as far as how many acres and whatnot. And that's Monarch Watch? Monarchwatch.org, yes. And go to their uh, free milkweed um, section um, and fill out the requirements for that. Okay, that's, that's great. Um, uh, and again, I want to encourage everyone to uh, come to the River Authorities uh, Festival this Saturday. I think they're still looking for a few volunteers, um, but there's going to be a citizen scientist um, information. There's going to be tagging information. There's going to be educational programs. It's going to be lots of fun for kids. So, um, so that's happening this Saturday. And um, uh, we just got a link. Uh, from Peter um, to out oh, to the festival that's happening on Saturday yes. and uh, he says by the way volunteer hours are not approved by by us because it's being sponsored by the River Authority um, no it's being not it's not being sponsored by the River Authority I'm sorry but their nonprofit partner the River Foundation still going to be a great great opportunity um, if you, you know, just to get out there and, uh, and uh, it's going to be a lot of fun. That's, I think, 930 till two this Saturday. Um, yeah, Amanda, real quick. Um, yes. Yeah. Some, the email that we got, if you're a River Warrior, uh, yes. were non-approved. Uh, okay. But there's, okay. other, there's other partners there that will be approved, like the Native Plant Society and some others, but the ones oh, that they send out. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And the tagging so, and so forth. Yeah. Oh, okay, depends. that's good to know. So maybe um, but, check out those opportunities through NIPSOT um, for, for getting some hours for volunteering. Um, right. Also, just go go to the festival. It sounds like a lot of fun. It's going to be great. Yeah, it'll be a lot of fun. It'll, it'll, yeah. There'll be a yeah. lot of educational vendors there and obviously lots of butterflies. Yeah. And if there's yeah. anyone um, that's, that's watching too, um they're going to have a uh an altar there so if you've had someone that has passed um either from covid or from anyone anything else recently or whatever we are actually doing memorial taggings as well so um if even if it's just for that if you have some a loved one that has passed on yeah that's that's a common theme for um uh dia de los muertos isn't it is yes. is that's monarch. the whole tie with the monarch migration as well. Yeah, yeah I, I mean, I, I mean, just the, I, that's just one of the spiritual ends of, of, of it. There's mm -hmm. so much that's tied culturally to the monarch butterfly as well mm -hmm. as um, everything else. I mean, it's not just an ecosystem thing. It's a cultural thing. There's a lot of history. There's a lot of um, everything that's tied 
um, to the monarch that actually matters to us as people. Right, right, yeah. Well, Drake, thank you so much. Thanks this, was, this was a great talk. We, we pulled it off. I think Yay. it went really well. <laughs> thank you. I took so many notes. Um, you have so much information for us and um, I, I encourage everyone to reach out to Drake um, for anything Monarch related that you, you need an answer to or you need help with. Um, we really okay. appreciate you doing this. Feel, feel free to share my, my phone number to um, my email, okay. but just so folks know, yeah, calling or texting is 10 times quicker than an email. <laughs> I, yes, I can concur. Yeah. Um, <laughs> And so we will, um, we're going to share this talk on our YouTube page, um, which everybody can find. Just go to YouTube, Alamo, Alamo Area Master Naturalist. We've got other previous talks. And we're going to um, try to figure out a way to maybe um, get your PowerPoint included on that. Yes. So that people can go through that if they want to. Um, I'll have to defer to somebody else who's more technologically advanced than I am. But we're going to try to figure that out. We'll, we'll work well. it out. We'll work it out. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you everybody for coming tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Drake.